Coming in at number 10, we have the time Peter grew and then lost four additional arms, literally making him an eight-limbed freak. This event took place during a period of time in which being Spider-Man had brought Peter nothing but pain, with Gwen Stacy's father having recently passed away, and Gwen believing Spider-Man to be responsible. Thus, Peter decided to get rid of his double life by developing a serum to remove his spider abilities. Unfortunately, testing serums on yourself rarely works out in the Marvel Universe, and Peter's spider powers are amplified to the point that four additional arms burst forth out of his body. And while Spider-Man would eventually be able to balance out his life and lose the additional limbs, it's still a bizarre tale of body horror that Peter is lucky to have gotten out of unscathed. Coming in at number 9, we have getting trampled by the rhino in the video game Spider-Man Miles Morales. This game is one of my favorites of the last couple years, and it opens with both Peter Parker and Miles Morales working together as Spider-Men to try and transport the rhino safely to the supervillain prison. Unfortunately, the rhino breaks free, and the opening tutorial of the game is trying to chase the villain down and stop his rampage. Unfortunately, since this is just the tutorial, Peter Parker does most of the fighting and winds up getting his butt kicked, getting hit with attacks that should definitely have shattered at least half the bones in his body. Luckily, Miles is eventually able to save the day by discovering his Venom Blast ability, but it's still a wonder how Spidey is able to even stand after all of that pummeling. Coming in at number eight, we have Firebrand burning Peter Parker alive. During another period where Spider-Man was a bit off his game, he got into a fight with the usually low-level villain Firebrand. Unfortunately, Spider-Man's taunts during the fight pushed Firebrand over the edge, causing him to fully unleash his power and blow up a city block. The resulting explosion was shown in graphic detail to burn both Peter's costume and his flesh, and the only reason he was able to survive without permanent scarring was due to the quick intervention of a hospital that usually only treats supervillains. I guess one perk of getting most of your face burnt off is that the doctors won't know exactly who they're healing. Nicely handled, Spider-Man. Number seven, Neutron Bomb Explosion. This one comes from Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight franchise. At the end of Dark Knight Rises, Batman seemingly sacrifices himself to save Gotham, moving a giant bomb outside of the city. Initially, they actually hoped to stabilize this bomb, which was made from a fusion reactor core. Unfortunately, that was not in the cards because Talia al Ghul destroys the only chamber in Gotham that they could have used to do so in time. Instead, Batman is forced to therefore fly the bomb out of the city over the water. He gets it far enough away that no one is harmed, other than probably some fish and marine life likely. Guess we just don't care about dropping bombs in the ocean. Aquaman, if he was there, would be like, eh, stop that. The other person that's possibly injured here, of course, is Batman himself, who is implied to be within the craft, or at the very least within the vicinity, to have piloted it. In reality, Batman miraculously survives the explosion and is living happily later with Selina Kyle, aka Catwoman. The two are living abroad for a while and laying low. We never learn how Batman manages to pull this one off though, so I guess he's bomb proof. I don't know. I don't know how you get out of that. I mean, he could have. The one thing I was thinking is, I was like, he could have ejected himself out of the craft at some point. I feel like you'd have to be far away. So I have questions. I have, but I don't have answers for you. I'm sorry. Number six, buried alive again. In this case, Batman was buried alive during the events of the Batman R.I.P. story arc. Here, he seemed to be double-crossed by his lover, Jezebel Jett, who it turned out was actually a secret member of the Black Glove, as well as one of its former victims. Batman ends up captured by the criminal organization and is buried alive by them, but appears to escape with ease. Although, at least, as he tells it this time, there is nothing easy about escaping a death trap as deadly as being buried alive. Batman here describes just how improbable and challenging that feat is, but proves that for him, it of course is not impossible. Which really shouldn't surprise us at this point because well, I mean he's already proven to be an expert in the matter of this kind of escape before. He's also like a master escape artist I guess. Still, he gets buried alive a lot. At this point people should really learn, you know, that's not gonna work for you. Though really the most amazing feat for me of Batman R.I.P. is that Bruce apparently suspected for some time that Jezebel wasn't what she seemed to be and had figured out that she was part of the trap before it all came to pass. My question is, I feel like if, if 
Bruce is claiming he knew this like from like almost day one. What? Why did this even happen? How did this even get to this point? What? All right, you know what? You're Batman, so I'm just gonna be like, okay, Batman, you got it. Batman knows everything. Number five, becoming brain dead. In issue number 115 of the original Brave and the Bold series, Batman is left brain dead after he's electrocuted by a trap while on a team up with the Atom, where he is trying to solve a case. The Atom knows that while Batman is currently brain dead, he only has hours left before the rest of his organs and his body will completely fail him. Instead of trying to find some way to get some sort of miraculous medical attention, he does what any good friend and colleague would do and decides to help Batman solve his final case. The Atom shrinks down, jumps inside Batman's body, and puppets Batman around from the inside. Sort of like a Weekend at Bernie's style. Fortunately, this somehow fixes Batman's impending death and brain deadness, so not only does the case get solved by Batman, but he's also saved by the Atom's weird machinations. Good job, I guess? I'm glad it all worked out in the end. Love when people are like, you're dead, but also I just jumped around on your organs, so now you're alive again. Yay. Number four, nuclear explosion. Or at least a nuclear level kryptonite missile explosion. Still, this was a pretty crazy one. In the Justice League Unlimited episode, The Doomsday Sanction, Batman is forced to pursue a missile en route to destroy an entire island and Superman and Doomsday along with it, who are entangled in a battle with one another on said island. When the missiles from his own craft won't work due to the kryptonite missile having magnetic repulsor shielding, Batman is forced to move the missile with his own ship. He does so and manages to successfully divert it, ejecting an escape pod at the last minute before it explodes. However, the explosion that we see happen is like a nuclear level fiery red mushroom cloud kind. It creates a giant tsunami which hits the island and impacts Batman's escape pod, causing him to lose communication with the rest of the league. Fortunately, he manages to survive somehow. I guess that was one strong escape pod and one strong Batman? The Bruce is definitely worse for wear by the end of this episode, confined to bed rest and sporting a neck brace when we see him at the end. Coming in at number three, we have the time that Deadpool accidentally killed and then resurrected Spider-Man twice. After a complicated series of events led to Deadpool being hired to kill his friend Spider-Man and being convinced that Peter had turned to evil, the merc with a mouth shot Peter Parker in the head unexpectedly at his apartment. This would be a pretty anticlimactic end to the spectacular Spider-Man, however, and Deadpool eventually convinced his demon girlfriend of the time to resurrect his buddy, because comic books are weird like that. In a comedic twist, Deadpool would shoot Peter again after briefly thinking that he had once more turned to evil, but eventually everyone wound up alive and safe even if this would continue to be one of the weirdest situations in Spider-Man's very weird history. Coming in at number two, we have the so-called death of the ultimate Spider-Man. In the comic book event that would lead to the debut of Miles Morales, the Peter Parker of the ultimate Marvel Universe had to die before a new Spider-Man could rise. In a final battle against his nemesis, the Green Goblin, the teenage Peter Parker protected his family against Norman Osborn's relentless and crazed attacks even after he'd already been mortally wounded by an assassin's bullet. While at the time this seemed like a tragic and dramatic end to the ultimate Peter Parker, it would eventually be revealed that he actually survived this intense battle, as the Oz formula that gave him his spider abilities also functionally made this Peter Parker immortal. Maybe it's just a weird comic book retcon, but the fact that Peter survived so many injuries is truly mind-blowing, and I can't wait to see where the ultimate universe takes us next. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have Spider-Man's head-crushing defeat in the original Infinity Gauntlet event. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we may have all gotten our hearts broken by that classic, I don't want to go, Mr. Stark, but the battle for the Infinity Gauntlet in the comics may have been even more brutal to Peter Parker than we'd ever want to see on the big screen. In the comics, Peter is able to briefly get the upper hand on Thanos with some web attacks to the face, but is then viciously beaten eaten by Thanos' lady companion, Taraxia, who is shown to kill the wall crawler by attacking him with a rock. 
pretty brutal for a Cosmic Marvel event. And while by the end of Infinity Gauntlet all of the killed heroes would be restored, this might just be one of the most bone-crushing losses ever suffered by Spider-Man. In its end, Rainbow Raider. Rage is never really a good thing to suppress. Trust me, I've had my fair share of suppressed emotions, but eventually, everything you feel will come boiling to the surface and it will be worse than before. This was demonstrated in the first CW crossover between Arrow and the Flash, called Flash vs. Arrow, where Barry gets whammied by Rainbow Raider and starts getting pretty pissed. So mad, in fact, that it's kind of like the DC TV version of Bully Maguire. No matter, I'm honestly surprised that the rage just didn't kill Barry or cause him to go so insane that someone had to kill him. I mean, like, obviously, they wouldn't. That would never be the case, but still, like, in a realistic scenario, or as realistic as we can get with superpowered beings, he would, in my mind, have gotten himself killed at some point during this altercation. If Reverse Flash wasn't stuck in 2014, I'm sure that he would have taken that opportunity to, like, you know... <laughs> right in his chest. In at 9, Flashpoint. A timeline of Barry's own creation where his mother doesn't die and he thus doesn't become the Flash. Oh, and don't forget the fact that Aquaman and Wonder Woman are at war because Barry's mom doesn't die. And at the very least in the animated movie, this resulted in them destroying the world. Literally destroying the planet. Barry has to run back in time and stop himself from saving his mother, letting her die just so that he can save the planet. But in this case, Flash literally outruns the destruction of a globe, of a planet, and does so in order to let his mom die. Like, holy crap, that's insane. I, I don't know if I would have the strength to do that. So, to me, it's pretty ridiculous that Barry firstly survived the destruction of the world, and then survived having to sacrifice his mother. Both emotionally and physically surviving this is pretty damn impressive in my personal opinion. He should either have exploded with the rest of the world, or not been strong enough to sacrifice his mother. Like, either way, she dies, right? So, like, you might as well keep your father out of prison and give her, like, another decade of life, right? And it ain't injustice. Barry siding with Superman and his regime during the beginning of Injustice is certainly one of the dumbest things he's done. I mean, Barry is faster than Superman, we've seen it many times. Barry left him in the dust at one point while trying to return to the Speed Force to sacrifice himself, saying that all their other races were for charity. So siding with Superman doesn't really do much for you. It's not like he can catch you if you decide to join Batman's insurgency. And considering how you sacrificed your mother for this planet's survival, I'm sure that you'd have normally been against the these ideals. I mean, he ended up agreeing with Shazam when he said that leveling cities was too far. And then that's when Barry decides to leave, after they've killed Billy. Why did you join in the first place, bro? I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. If I were Superman, I would have just killed the Flash instantly, no matter what side he was on. Because in reality, he's like the only one who could pose a threat to me. This also brings up another question. If Barry did the whole vibrating hand thing, so that, that like reverse Flash does, so that he was the frequency of air. Could he kill Superman? Or would he need like a Kryptonian glove? But like he's air, right? So he should be able to pass through his chest. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you think. And at seven, Savitar. The fact that Barry was able to survive the whole Savitar thing from the Flash season three will always escape me. I won't really ever understand how they ended up defeating a literal future version of Barry. I get how they managed to do it, but that was incredibly unrealistic, even for a show about a man who can run at the speed of light. Since technically, Savitar would have known beforehand that the timeline was changing, since technically that should, in my brain, at least be how time travel works. Like, something changes, uh, even if the current Barry doesn't know it yet, the Barry of the future would, because he would have to be from that time, right? That's just how it would work. But that's not how it works in the show, so that's, that's fine, I guess. I, I don't see how it would ever have been possible to beat a future version of The Flash without this, but like, I, I know that he couldn't really die, since if he died, Savitar wouldn't be able to happen, despite his taunting in earlier episodes. I feel like that was just a way to prevent Barry from killing himself to stop him, but still, you shouldn't have won against Savitar, straight up. Coming in at number seven, we have the time Spider-Man had to take on the entire Sinister Six at once in the PlayStation 4 Spider-Man video game. After a breakout at the supervillain prison, The Raft, Peter is faced with his worst nightmare when he's surrounded by the combined team of the Rhino, the Vulture, Scorpion, Electro, and Mr. Negative, who are more than enough to weaken Spider-Man before the arrival of the leader of the Sinister Six, Dr. Octopus, 
who up until this point had been a friend and mentor to this universe's Peter Parker. The betrayal cuts Peter deep and his wounded body is thrown into New York Harbor, only barely surviving by holding on to a floating oil drum. This beatdown was so bad, Peter eventually needed a specialized costume to be strong enough to go up against Doc Ock once more. Coming in at number six, we have the time that Spider-Man was tortured by the dark ancient sorcerer, Kulan Goth. During a comic event that saw the entire city of Manhattan transformed into an alternate medieval fantasy version, Spider-Man was one of the few heroes who remembered the world as it truly was. As punishment for rebelling against Kulan Goth's rule, this version of Spider-Man was tortured and put on display for all of Kulan Goth's enemies to see. And while Spider-Man would eventually be restored once Kulan Goth was defeated and reality reverted back to normal, it's still incredibly disturbing to see one of Marvel's greatest heroes being put in such a violent situation. Coming in at number five, we have the time Peter Parker became a literal spider monster. We've already covered a storyline on this list where Peter grew some extra limbs, but during an event in which the concept of the spider totems was first introduced into the Marvel mythology, Peter Parker found himself transformed into a gigantic spider-human hybrid, with horrifying mandibles and a hunger for human flesh. Eventually, this creature would appear to die and then be reborn as a fresh Peter Parker, now possessing organic web shooters. While this may have just been a really convoluted storyline to make Spidey's web status the same as the Tobey Maguire movies, it's still a body horror storyline that makes my skin crawl. Coming in at number four, we have the time that Spider-Man lifted an entire building and lived to tell the tale. In one of the most iconic, defining moments for the entire character, Spider-Man found himself trapped under the rubble of a collapsed building, with water rapidly filling the area as well. In order to save the life of his Aunt May, Peter had to lift the weight of the entire building off of his back. This is the pivotal moment where Spider-Man showed just how strong he could be when the situation called for it, and just how far he was willing to push his body to save the lives of the people he loves. Something that would go on to become a defining feature of the character. But seriously, Peter, you should probably get someone to spot you the next time you lift something that heavy. Getting close to the end in number three, beating teleportation. There was a comic called The Human Race, where a group of cosmic gamblers who existed at the edge of the universe traveled around the cosmos and made bets with each other for fun. They were ultra mega powerful, so this was their only form of entertainment. They picked speedsters throughout the cosmos and then made them race each other in their bets. And then the speedster who lost got his or her home planet destroyed. In one such bet, Earth gets the attention of these cosmic gamblers. So Wally West, the fastest man on this planet, became the representative of Earth. During the race with a fellow speedster in the bet, Wally, who realized that the cosmic gamblers will never refuse a friendly wager, makes a bet with them that he will reach Earth first, despite the fact that the cosmic gamblers can teleport to any location in the cosmos instantly. This appeared to be a ridiculous gambit. The cosmic gamblers agree, and before the race even begins, using the kinetic energy of everyone on Earth and then some, Wally ran at what is called the trans time velocity, fast enough to beat teleportation, which is basically 23 tradactillion times faster than the speed of light. Yeah, that's 23 with like 20 zeros, or 30 zeros, something like that. He reasonably should have lost and gotten the whole planet destroyed because there's no way that in hell that would happen, or he would have just disintegrated while running that fast. If Barry dies during crisis, he should have died repeating teleportation. But ultimately, in at number two, Armageddon. The most recent episodes of The Flash started off season eight with the Armageddon crossover, with Barry starting to believe he's going crazy and and in the future ends up creating Armageddon, destroying the entire world. However, this turns out not to be the case, since Reverse Flash is actually the one who creates Armageddon by turning himself into the Flash and then causing Barry as Reverse Flash to fix things. In order to fix things though, Barry must run at Mach 20, which is 20 times the speed of sound. But Thon doing this behind him as well, in order to stop him, ends up tearing the world apart, at least until Barry fixes everything, causing the Reverse Flash point to no longer exist. Yeah, this was pretty ridiculous, but also a good story. Some of the best writing we've seen from the show in a while. That reverse Flashpoint episode 
was awesome. But I, I am kind of partial to some alternate timeline episodes where we can see how things could have been. But honestly, I'm surprised Barry survived this, and for good reason. Because the episode before he ran back in time, Barry had Jefferson Pierce, Black Lightning, drain him of his speed nearly completely so that he couldn't hurt anyone again. He wanted to do it completely, but Jefferson stopped. But according to Thon, Barry only had around 5% of his speed left, maybe less. So how could Barry have run at Mach 20? And how could Thon, if he was truly the Flash in this timeline, not have caught up with him? That seems fairly ridiculous if you ask me. And finally, in at number one, Black Flash. Black Flash is the Grim Reaper of the Speed Force, making his first appearance in The Flash Volume 2, number 138, in 1998. He was seen before the deaths of several speedsters, including Barry Allen, Johnny Quick, and Bart Allen, and in essence, making him the speedster embodiment of death. In the CW Arrowverse, he was Hunter Zolomon after being caught by Time Wraiths, and was killed in Season 3's finale by Killer Frost when Black Flash came for Savitar since the Paradox had finally caught up with him. In the comics, he dies thanks to the combined efforts of multiple speedsters, including Jesse Quick, Jay Garrick, and Max Mercury and while he was able to race Black Flash to the end of time, causing death to have no meaning. Which didn't matter for long, since Barry Allen then returns in the Flash Rebirth storyline as the new Black Flash, unknowingly, until Professor Zoom takes over the title when his corpse is raised in the Blackest Night storyline. Either way, if this man is supposed to be the representation of death, and what inevitably comes for all speedsters, how was a Barry able to outrun him at any point? How was anyone able to outrun him? How was Wally able to outrun him? I don't know, okay? It shouldn't have happened. Number 10, Buried Alive. One of the worst ways to go would obviously be to be buried alive. Not only that, but it would be near impossible to escape for this to happen to you. Then again, that wasn't the case for Batman. And he didn't just wake up in a coffin, but he was also strapped into a straight jacket as well. The even more crazy part of this story is the villain who managed to pull off trapping Batman here was kind of just a dude. Not any of his big A-list villains or anything like that. Just a guy with ingenuity named Ed Wiley. While Wiley wouldn't survive the story, Batman would make it out alive. As Superman races against the clock to find and save Batman, by the time he gets there and digs up the coffin that Batman was buried in, Batman has already escaped and is actually standing right behind him. I know it's Batman, but this is all still pretty impressive and insane. Number 9. Joining a Club This doesn't sound like an epic death, and I guess it's not really, but it is a really ridiculous one, hence why it's included here. And so, here we go. This one comes from the classic Batman stories of old. In issue 72 of Batman, Bruce hears tell of a new and exclusive club, and so of course, has to be a member. The club is so exclusive because in order to join, you need to have basically cheated death. Without much hesitation, Bruce scarfs down a poison which will kill him with the plan to be revived by a doctor, but making it look like the whole thing just happened accidentally. Oh my goodness, I just accidentally ate this poison. The rest of the issue involves him trying to protect his newfound friends of the Death Cheaters Club from a criminal who is denied entry and seeks revenge because comics. Also though, I feel like if you wanted to be part of this club and you didn't get in, it's kind of a weird club anyway, so I don't know why you'd be upset, but okay. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to hear about more death-defying Batman moments, you know there are a lot more, you know, then be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Cave In. At the end of Batman Endgame, both Batman and Joker seemingly die. The two of them are crushed to death, or so it is implied by a cave-in. In reality, they are saved and healed by basically magic science water, referred to as Dionysium. Dionysium is healing properties which allow both the Joker and Batman to survive and be completely removed and healed of their injuries. Unfortunately, they also both seemingly lose their memories as well, effectively giving them a sort of kind of like weird reset. Gotta love when good old magic science water that is connected to the dark multiverse and just happens to be below Gotham saves you. This whole resurrection would also be the spark that would initiate all of the Dark Knight's metal stuff and everything that came after that. Also, if you think Dionysium looks similar to the Lazarus Pits, that's because it's believed to be an ingredient for those immortal and maddening pits. And it's six, DeVoe. 
The Flash Season 4 is not a favorite among fans. We all thought that we wanted a non-speedster as the main villain for a season, however, some dude who can literally think a lot was not what we had envisioned. But honestly, looking at what DeVoe was able to do, he was even more powerful than Savitar who was literally a future version of Barry. Like, DeVoe could accurately predict every single thing that was going to happen, and the only way they could defeat him was by getting his wife on their side, getting Barry out of prison, and then somehow having Having Ralph take over his mind again from inside DeVoe or like inside of his mind that DeVoe was controlling and then not having any of the other powers that DeVoe had when he was in Ralph's body, which I don't understand. That whole ordeal, okay, was probably realistically impossible, but they somehow managed to pull it off. DeVoe should have been the end of Barry and the entirety of Team Flash. Like, as soon as Barry came out of the Speed Force, DeVoe should have killed him. Like, he made the bus metas and then he got out. Like, now you don't need to worry, right? You've offed him. Or, like, kill Barry as soon as, like, he did what you needed him to do. Like, as soon as he trained Ralph enough, you just go and you off Barry and then you take over Ralph. Most of the villains in these shows fail because they make, like, one stupid mistake. Okay? And this is why I'm the hero, because if I was the villain, I wouldn't make dumb mistakes and the world would have been destroyed already. Have I through in number 5, Crisis on Infinite Earths. Technically speaking, the comic version of Barry Allen did survive Crisis on Infinite Earths, despite everyone believing him to be dead at the time. Since he returned to the Speed Force after turning into the lightning bolt that ended up giving him his powers to begin with. But after transforming into pure lightning, traveling through time and space, and striking himself, Barry was sent into the Speed Force and then later escapes and comes back into our world in the Flash Rebirth storyline. So technically he survived the comic version of Crisis because he didn't die, he just transcended dimensions, I guess. But he also survived the Crisis from the CW crossover as well, since in this instance, despite like six seasons of us seeing a newspaper saying that our Barry vanishes, the Barry Allen from the 90s Flash series, aka Earth 90, was the one who ended up disappearing. Even though we literally saw a newspaper telling us about how our Flash died for six years. And no matter what, unless Barry didn't have his speed, that article stayed true. The byline changed, the articles around it changed, but the fact that Barry vanished in Crisis never did as long as he had his speed. So I don't know how he got out of that one. I guess like killing off one main character in that crossover was enough for the CW, but they would have just brought him back again. So like, what's the deal here? In 4, fought the Speed Force. Speaking of the CW, going from a crisis where every Earth gets destroyed, it's hard to make any other story seem worth it. However, the absolute crazy thing is that in the following season of The Flash, Season 7, they upped the stakes by having Barry fight the literal Speed Force. A reborn Speed Force, might I add, since Barry ended up killing it when Oliver Queen as the Spectre brought out its full potential in order to save the multiverse. So. Barry and Iris end up essentially giving birth to another one, but like birth adjacent. But while they were rebirthing the Speed Force, they also created three other forces that were all evil for one time or another. And then they get all the other ones on their side, but the Speed Force wants to kill the other forces because she thinks that the other forces are trying to kill her. And, and the Speed Force looks like Barry's mom again, and then they even start calling her Nora. Honestly, it's a question as to how anyone watching this survived this storyline, let alone Barry fighting the literal thing that gave him his powers that he killed and then rebirthed and then was basically the father of even though it looked like his mom. Season 7 definitely had some issues, but Barry should honestly not have won against the Speed Force. Number 3, and buried alive again! At this point, I'm like, I need to do a list of all the times that Batman was buried alive because it happens so frequently. Another time when Bruce was buried alive, it was under a bunch of skulls and bones in the catacombs below Gotham. The Riddler set off explosives that left him buried completely under dirt and bones. While all we're left with at the end of issue 27 is a hand coming up out of the dirt, the following story issue, issue 29 in this case, Bruce seems to find the inner strength to emerge from all that dirt. Although how he's able to get the leverage to pull himself up there? I have no idea. I don't know how that logically would work. Being completely buried in compounded dirt is challenging to get out of without having some kind of help or leverage. Something basically to use to pull yourself out or hopefully something to pull you out of the dirt. And in this case, he doesn't have any of that. But I guess this is Batman and so his inner will and his strength as well as those outer muscles and his sense of determination is really all he needs. So he's just like, 
Ah, I did it. <laughs> if there's anything I've learned from Batman, you can do anything if you just focus hard enough and you're determined and you believe. Number two, dodges omega beams. Speaking of things that seem impossible, but if you believe, Bruce might just be a human guy with no superpowers, but he has proven time and time again how indestructible and skilled he is. Like when he faced Darkseid at the end of the Justice League Unlimited animated series. While facing off with the epic villain Darkseid fired his Omega Beams at Batman, the Omega Beam is a power that is notorious for being accurate and just like never, never missing its target. You may have seen it before and noticed all those sharp angles involved every time Darkseid fires it. That's actually because it moves around any objects that are in the way of its target, also chasing said target down until it is hit. Now in the animated series, however, this wasn't the case, as Batman manages to dodge the beam by basically putting a parademon in its way. This causes the beam to strike and vaporize the parademon, leaving Batman safe. Darkseid is impressed, and I think all of us watching are too, because that's like impossible. Impressive, Darkseid says, no one has ever dodged my omega beam. That's probably because it's not even possible, Darkseid. And yet. Number one, Omega Sanction. Maybe one of the craziest things that Bruce has survived was when he took the Omega Sanction straight to the face from Darkseid, or straight to the sides of the head, I guess, more specifically. The Omega Sanction is an unstoppable force, but not for Batman. Well, Batman was seemingly vaporized in this fight, in reality, this was actually a clone, and he himself had survived. Instead, Batman was transported through time and ended up having crazy adventures through time as he attempted to return home. But of course, for a long while, while, with his charred skeleton present after the fact of his not real death, many of us thought this might be the end this time for Batman. Of course, based on everything that has happened to this man prior that hasn't managed to kill him permanently yet, we maybe should have known better. You can't kill Batman. Not even Darkseid's Omega Sanction can. And Batman apparently in the animated world can just dodge Omega Beams, so he's invincible. Dude.